satire. Are you interested in the uh, younger generation form of humor? Do you know what I mean? Oh, yes, very much so. The young, healthy child, well-nursed, is, at a year old, a most delicious, nourishing, and wholesome food. What tale shall serve me here among mine angry and defrauded young? The only time a lampooning went over the edge it was during, you remember, the week that was. That was the week that was. We always do Atmos, House of Commons Atmos, which is indeterminate noises that they seem to make in the House of Commons, which is appalled and surprised a lot of people, I think. But we do all that before the sketch starts, always, just to create. And then, order, order. Order, order. 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 Mm. Questions to the Prime Minister. John Blundy. Order to us, the Prime Minister. Hello, I'm Simon Hoggart, and this is the first in a series of programmes about the history of satire. Political satire in my case, but satire of all kinds over the next month as Michael Bywater, Harry Thompson, Frank Whitford and Humphrey Carpenter take it in turns to trawl the archives here in the basement of Broadcasting House. I'm certainly not going to answer questions from a member of the government who doubled unemployment in five years. Peter Worth. Is the Prime Minister intending to take action now the inflation rate has I'm reached... I'm not going to answer a question for the party who left us with a 12% inflation rate. But I'm a Liberal. Well, I don't know how you had the gall to ask the question considering your party passed the Great Reform Bill of 1832. Back in the 1830s, when every man wore a wig, satirists were far crueler than they are today. When King George IV died, the Times remembered him less than fondly. There never was an individual less regretted by his fellow creatures than this deceased king. What eye has wept for him? What heart has heaved one sob of unmercenary sorrow? If George IV had a friend, a devoted friend in any rank of life, we protest that the name of him or her never reached us. An inveterate voluptuary, especially if he be an artificial person, is of all known beings the most selfish. Nothing more remains to be done or said about George IV but to pay, as pay we must, for his profusion. I think Britain has a long and very powerful tradition of political satire because of a sort of a national characteristic which is a sort of inability to take its leaders seriously. I mean, it's a terribly healthy characteristic, this. The desire to laugh at them has always been just as strong as any desire to vote for them. And um, the idea that the British are somehow very sort of stiff and public and formal is a very 19th century. Um, the 18th century satirists, when the rudery really began, um, would have none of that. I'm um, the age of Pope and Swift and Gilray, Crookshank. I mean, these people were not um, reverent about politics. They thought they mattered, and that's why they covered them. Um, but they did it in their own way. A Modest Proposal by Jonathan Swift I have been assured by a very knowing American of my acquaintance in London that a young, healthy child, well-nursed, is, at a year old, a most delicious, nourishing and wholesome food, whether stewed, roasted, baked or boiled. And I make no doubt that it will equally serve in a fricassee or a ragout. I desire the reader will observe that I calculate my remedy for this one individual kingdom of Ireland and for no other that ever was, is, or ever can be upon earth. Swift used what must be the most ferocious form of satire, taking the victim's general line of thought and extending it to an absurd and terrible conclusion. It would be hard to think of a more graphic way of demonstrating callousness, laziness and intellectual corruption. It is difficult to appreciate the satire of past generations without footnotes, and there's nothing that kills a joke dead than having to have it explained to you. Ian Hislop, editor of Private Eye. Which is the problem with most um, satire, is that it is fairly transitory. You need to know what's going on um, in order to get the joke and, and get the point. So, um, I mean, reading 20-year-old copies of Private Eye, some of it is entirely impenetrable. You cannot imagine what this was about. Or looking at that was the week that was, when they show clips of it to tell you about this golden age of satire. And you have a look at it and you think, I have no idea what that's about. But then occasionally in the middle of those things there is a gem which is somehow universal and you think that's incredibly funny, that's as funny now as it was then. 
And it, I mean, I've read a lot of sort of um, very old satire. I was very keen on Juvenal, the um, Roman poet. And uh, the best thing about him is that sort of um, amazingly contemporary feel when he writes an attack on his landlord um, for putting the rent up and not um, taking any precautions about fire um, and the building comes down or when he complains about barristers wasting his time and charging him too much. Um, you suddenly think, well, this actually could have been written at any time. If a debtor refuses to pay back the sum I lent him, my case will have to wait. It'll be set down for the most crowded and popular session, and even then I'll be subjected to a thousand irksome postponements. The courtroom will have just got ready, one lawyer's taking off his cloak, another one's gone out for a piss, and then presto. There's an adjournment, and we all disperse. And I think there is a, a really definite Western tradition of satire that goes you know, straight from Juvenal, who more or less invented it, uh, right the way through into the English language, and um, from there to now. I, I do think that sort of angry, bad-tempered comedy about public life has um, a long-standing and quite a useful place um, in Western civilization. Parliamentary, as opposed to more wide-ranging political satire, is obviously much more recent than juvenile. I suppose that if we parliamentary sketch writers have our own hero or patron saint, it would have to be Charles Dickens, one of the earliest and still the most famous inhabitant of the press gallery. England has been in a dreadful state for some weeks. Lord Coodle would go out, Sir Thomas Doodle wouldn't come in, and there being nobody in Great Britain to speak of except Coodle and Doodle, there has been no government. It is a mercy that the hostile meeting between those two great men, which at one time seemed inevitable, did not come off, because if both pistols had taken effect and Coodle and Doodle had killed each other, it is to be presumed that England must have waited to be governed until young Coodle and young Doodle, now in frocks and long stockings, were grown up. Still, England has been some weeks in the dismal strait of having no pilot, as was well observed by Sir Lester Dedlock, to weather the storm. And the marvellous part of the matter is that England has not appeared to care very much about it, but has gone on eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage as the old world did in the days before the flood. We don't often associate satire with the Victorians and tend to picture them suffused with boundless respect for their boundless empire. Yet satire did exist. Gilbert and Sullivan lampooned contemporary politicians in a fairly mild way. So, a little more sharply, did Hilaire Belloc, writing at the turn of the century. It happened to Lord Lundy then, as happens to so many men. Towards the age of 26, they shoved him into politics. But very soon his friends began to doubt if he were quite the man. Thus, if a member rose to say, as members do from day to day, arising out of that reply, Lord Lundy would begin to cry. A hint at harmless little jobs would shake him with convulsive sobs. They let him sink from post to post, from 1,500 at the most, to eight and barely six, and then to be curator of Big Ben. And finally there came a threat to oust him from the cabinet. This verse is from a poem titled in full, Lord Lundy, who was too freely moved to tears and thereby ruined his political career. Crying, as sketch writers and satirists all know, is the first big mistake a politician can make. It's the squeal that shows that the knife blade has slid in. Here's Bob Marshall Andrews, MP. Some members of Parliament are very upset um, to be satirised, um, driven, driven to uh, crying home from school. But... Uh, but uh, quite, quite a lot of members of Parliament, uh, I think, take it in the spirit to which it's uh, intended. I think it's very important not to be upset, or at least not to be openly upset. It's, it's the classic reaction to bullying, isn't it? If you squeal, um, then they like it, and then they'll, they'll come back for more. The art is, is pursuing the weakness, seeing where the weakness is, and then exploiting it. And I, I don't see anything wrong with that. One should be deeply unfair. One should be wholly unjust all the time and I don't think that fairness or balance have anything to do with what we do but just occasionally when I get angry with somebody I, I think one can make as much fun as one likes of, of people the more fun the better and it doesn't matter if it's fair or not but when an element of real anger comes in and one, one attacks somebody in an angry way I often finish my sketch at the end of the day thinking wow that was fantastic then I read it the next morning and feel 
a little bit guilty and a bit ashamed of myself for going for somebody. I, maybe anger should fuel satire in the background, but when it comes too much into the foreground, no, I think I prefer a little levity and even occasionally a little geniality. Matthew Paris, my opposite number as sketch writer on The Times, taking a more kindly view than the assailants of the 1830s would ever have done. The modern revival of satire began very suddenly in the 1960s. Writing before then, one of my predecessors on The Guardian called his collected works The Glory of Parliament. If you or I to publish, were to publish a collection of our sketches under the title The Glory of Parliament, people would absolutely assume we were, we were being sarcastic. There was plenty of levity, if not much geniality, in the way the new instant generation of satirists treated the politicians of their day. It's sometimes hard to remember the impact, in a more reverential era, of Peter Cook's take-off of Harold Macmillan in the 1961 review Beyond the Fringe. According to their tastes or expectations, people were shocked, horrified, and sometimes utterly delighted. Good evening. I have recently been travelling round the world <laughs> on your behalf and at your expense <laughs> visiting some of the chaps with whom I hope to be shaping your future. I went first to Germany <laughs> with the Bundesrepublik and now I spoke to the German Foreign Minister, Herr uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and we exchanged many frank words in our respective languages. <laughs> I think a lot of it was to do with Macmillan and the Tory government and the fact that the, what was called the establishment, that was the name of Peter Cook's club, was inspired by this fuddy-duddy old moustachioed Macmillan, uh, who is a terrific snob, apart from anything else, and his whole cabinet was full of dukes and various people who were related to him. And he was followed by the Earl of Hume, who to private eye at that time was a wonderfully hilarious figure. We used to call him Bailey Vass. And it inspired, I think, a sort of anti the, the whole business of the establishment, of course, had gone on before the angry young men and people had already preceded us. And this satire, I think, came in as the sort of next fashionable wave. Astonishing revelation by Scottish newspaper. Douglas Hume, an imposter. In an amazing report, the Aberdeen Evening Express last week revealed that the man known to the country as Sir Alec Douglas Hume is none other than the notorious Scottish imposter Bailey Vass. Sir Alec, or Bailey Vass, last night said, I have no idea who this Vass fellow is. All I can say is that I don't envy him his job as Prime Minister. When it was pointed out that Sir Alec, or Vass, was in fact Prime Minister, he replied, Don't bore me with statistics. I can't be expected to know everything. It was supposed to be satire, wasn't it? It was called satire, but uh, I, I think it was a bit cruel. I don't think it was very... Uh, um, I, didn't, I, I must say, I didn't like that at all. Lord Hume, speaking there, was wrong. In modern terms, it was hardly cruel at all. Private Eye called him Bailey Vance because of the mixed-up picture caption in an Aberdeen newspaper. It wasn't a savage attack, but it was very silly. Call a politician the worst national leader since Attila the Hun, and you subtly flatter him. You give him a walk-on part in history. Give him a silly name instead, and you simply diminish him. As Lord Carrington's press secretary once said angrily to me, the foreign secretary does not mind criticism. He does, however, expect to be taken seriously. As the new satire entered the national culture, it almost certainly helped the Conservatives to lose the 1964 election. Obituary. The death occurred on October the 18th, 1963, of the Conservative Party. The Conservative Party had been suffering from severe Macmillan for the last seven years, and although this had finally cleared up, its condition was so debilitated as a result that a sudden attack of Lord Hume caused its immediate demise. Uh, about a week ago, I saw the Prime Minister on television. <laughs> it's a fact, I did. 
I'm just as much allowed to watch television as any of you. I have my favorite programs as you have. And this wasn't one of them. At the time, many people thought that the Tory defeat would inevitably mean the end of the satire boom. How could anyone satirize the new, classless, forward-looking, untainted Labour Party? In fact, it proved far easier than anyone had imagined. And then afterwards, when the Labour government came in, and Macmillan went, and particularly after the assassination of Kennedy, I think, the whole mood then changed. And the eye went through a very difficult patch at that point, before it got the measure of Wilson. And then, of course, Wilson developed into the most wonderful character that Private Eye has ever had to deal with. Order, order, order. The first question from the Honourable Member for Rochdale. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister, an awkward and embarrassing question. I pass. The Prime Minister realised he cannot say I pass unless he is a mastermind. I pass. <laughs> it's the way I tell him, isn't it, Michael? I think he was a, a wonderful satirical figure mm. uh, with uh, all his absurd schemes about solving the Vietnam War and giving the Beatles MBs and all that sort of thing and culminating in Marcia Williams being given an honour and his honours list and... It was all absolute classic stuff, and I don't think you've ever seen... That was, the, I would have thought, the golden years of private time. In many ways, verbal satirists are like cartoonists. When a new political figure emerges, the caricaturists look for distinguishing features. Freckles, a cleft chin, prominent ears, minor points which a layperson might scarcely notice. These then become a shorthand which makes that person instantly recognisable in a few lines. Satirists also seek out the defining characteristics of a personality. But that isn't always so simple. Sometimes it's very difficult to make satire work. Our classic case is Mrs Thatcher. Um, and it would be difficult to find um, any evidence of satire having dented um, Mrs Thatcher's um, popularity or strength, largely because the perceived vision of her, i.e. an extremely strong, arrogant, aggressive woman, was exactly the image she wanted to project. So there was no gap between reality and the caricature. She didn't mind the caricature. Uh, that's part of what she was. I'm certainly not being told to sit down by some little jerk with a wig sitting in a big chair. One way around the problem was to use someone close to the victim to reflect him or her back to the reader. Private Eye used Mrs. Wilson's diary, and later the best known of all, Dear Bill. I just actually spotted this, I may, and you can cut this out of the tape, a moment uh, <laughs> when I uh, describe Wurzel Gummidge, Michael Foote going into battle with the boss. Our next thing was Emma to go down to the Circus Maximus to do battle with old Wurzelus Gamages, the Tribune of the Plebs, uh, armed with the new unemployment figures clearly scenting blood. According to Boris, who was in the Distinguished Strangers Gallery, that is uh, the uh, Russian agent who lives at Number 10, who is again and again a bit of hot water, it seems, at the present, Wurzel did his usual knockabout turn, roars of ribaldry from the smelly ox brigade, much coming and going from the bar, cries of resign, etc., whereupon the boss weighed in with the Queen Boudicca of your act, scimitars flashing at the hubcaps, and cut them all to ribbons. Poor old Wurzel soundly reprimanded for making jokes about a tragedy over which he had no control, and the old boy staggered off into the night muttering under his breath. The late John Wells, who co-wrote Dear Bill and played Mr. Thatcher on stage, once in front of him and his wife, who sat through the performance with gritted teeth. Several times I turned down invitations to meet Dennis Thatcher. To be quite honest, I feared that the reality might spoil the satire. I think it's spirit. It's, um, it's ESP, in a way. Or it may be just P-I-S-S-E-D. <laughs> Neither Dennis Thatcher nor I accept this impeachment. It's a little hard, after a struggle of half a century in politics and journalism, to find that you're really only known because you appear in some odd letter in a rather <laughs> curious magazine. But, I mean, why be proud about it? Bill Deeds, a journalist who became an MP and then returned to journalism, is a sort of poacher-turned-gamekeeper who finally went back to poaching. Roy Hattersley, the former deputy leader of the Labour Party, has also worn both those hats. I think political satire always depended on caricature of appearance to a degree. The great punch cartoons about Gladstone and Israeli... Uh, often portrayed 
each one of those two great men in very unflattering physical life. Uh, Disraeli with ringlets, uh, which were not enormously popular in um, 19th century England. Gladstone as a crazy old man. Indeed, punch cartoons of Gladstone made him out to be crazy more often than not. I think it's an unavoidable part of the genre. Keep calm now, Neil. Yeah. Keep calm. They, I, I can't help it, Roy. No good news on interest rates. No joy on houses, job training and investment in industry. Totally ignore the Tories. The Tories have created this medal for themselves and now they're taking it out of the very people who voted for them. It, it, it's a bloody outrage. Neil, Neil, pull yourself together. Uh, you know the tears in your eyes. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Roy. I, I just can't keep my feelings under control any longer. Oh, well, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> it won't be long now. They've really done it this time. <laughs> uh, 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 you feel better now? <laughs> When Kinnock and Hattersley were forced together in 1983, the sketch writers sprang into action. Michael Weiss in The Guardian wrote, Yesterday, Mr. Neil Kinnock came out in something of a rash during the presentation of Labour's manifesto. Arriving to a fanfare from Barry Manilow Remembers Brahms, he walked down the aisle side by side with Mr. Roy Hattersley. Both men wore red roses, in keeping with the party's commitment to florism, the creation of one million new jobs in the flower industry. Mr. Hattersley looked a shade self-conscious, as well he might. It may have been an ad man's idea of terrific television, but in the flesh it looked like a gay wedding. Not that such notions still appear in Labour manifestos. Now and again, an idea or insight so perfectly captures its victim that it takes him over and becomes his public image. And there's nothing he can do about it. I struck rather lucky with um, Vulcanology. I had actually tried it out on other MPs before, but no one had noticed it worked for Vulcan. It uh, worked for, I even think of him as Vulcan now. And many, many years later, the Sun newspaper was actually giving out Vulcan ears to its readers in a bid to drum up support for John Redwood's bi bid for the leadership, and I felt deeply proud and humbled. Mr. Redwood made a joke about a Vulcan being unable to see the joke about Vulcan jokes. There was a danger that his microchips might fuse at the fiendish internal logic of this inferential sequence. But though his eyes bulged for a moment, all was well. All in all, it was a successful performance. His clack of earthling riffraff cheering, he wound up the meeting. What we wondered would be his final word. No extra charge, he declared. Mr. Redwood must have seen this in a supermarket, recorded it as a useful idiomatic phrase, and inputted it onto the wrong disk drive in his logic system. It was in the back of everyone's mind, including his own. It's only the day I spent with him in the election. He spent all his time trying to sort of order pints of beer or, you know, things to, to prove that he was a real, uh, you know, bloke. And having this very stilted, going into conversa uh, shops and having very stilted conversations, trying to, you know, about the weather and things, which he'd obviously never tried before. But he was just trying to prove that he wasn't a Vulcan, and in so doing, proving that he was. Craig Brown, who is also Wallace Arnold, Bell Littlejohn, and the author of privatised spoof diaries, which skewer public figures by lampooning their own, usually rather conceited, view of themselves. More and more, I think, it's understanding politicians and not uh, portraying them all as spitting image tended to do, as if they were sort of minor versions of Hitler. You know, and it's much more interesting to kind of look inside Geoffrey Howe's head and see the way he works and and see him closer to just a normal person who by accident has got into politics and maybe shouldn't be there, but, you know, and see him uh, the way he wriggles around. Curiously, in the reporting of Parliament, it's almost only the satire which has survived. Sometimes we feel we're the only journalists watching Parliament at all and, and feel some sort of responsibility to, to give a sense of the occasion. So we're torn in lots of different directions. The moral high horse, uh, the low ground, uh, the anecdote uh, and the satire. Sometimes we are the only journalist there actually apart from the uh, press association reporter keeping his lonely vigil at the front of the press gallery. When I first came here a quarter of a century ago to the Houses of Parliament, your paper, The Times, had 16 full-time people whose job it was to fill up to two whole pages of The Times with the daily parliamentary report. That's utterly vanished now, and it seems to have vanished from every other paper too. And, and one of the c constant complaints of MPs is that there is no coverage like that. Uh, all they get is the sketch, which is poking fun at them. Why do you think this is? Because they aren't interesting. I don't think anybody read the parliamentary pages of The Times when we did publish them. That's why we stopped publishing them. It's a problem for us. If one was to do a satire on EastEnders, you can assume on the part of uh, your audience uh, a, a pretty good knowledge of all the characters in EastEnders. We're doing a satire now 
on some 650 men, of w men and women, most of whom are completely unknown to our readers. So we have to spend the first half of our sketches actually setting these characters up, explaining who they are, and then we have them dancing around for the remaining three or four hundred words. It is difficult sometimes to satirise that which is increasingly unfamiliar to the reader. Even the broadcasting of Parliament, which MPs hoped would mean that their unvarnished words would reach a wider audience, has not had that effect. Even now, MPs are protesting about the BBC's plans to move yesterday in Parliament onto long wave only. On the air. As the BBC has for days seemingly been reminding us every two and a half minutes, yesterday was the historic first day of the historic permanent broadcasting of the historic House of Commons. Order, order, he cried historically. And indeed, hysterically. For one could be forgiven for suspecting that someone in the Beeb had told dear old George to speak up for the benefit of the microphones and to put on something of a show for the occasion. One feels sure that the corporation is full of trainee producers named Cindy and Mandy, and one of them, perhaps, asked the occupant of the chair to camp it up a bit, speaky darling. Anyway, Mr. Thomas gave his all for the listening millions, or hundreds. Spectator editor Frank Johnson was himself a sketch writer back in 1978. He suspects that the politicians themselves have decamped from the Commons. Politics at the moment, and perhaps into the foreseeable future, is not simply about the floor of the House of Commons, or even not at all about the floor of the House, the floor of, the House of Commons. It's about sound bites on television, these interviews that um, politicians give at Sunday lunchtime, which, no, which the ordinary public don't watch, but which I would have thought are very good subjects for sketching and for, for, for satire. If I were national newspaper editor having to appoint a political sketch writer these days, I think I would ask him to sketch interviews on television or on the radio, today program, at least as much as I would ask him to sketch um, the House of Commons. Increasingly we have to turn to the once largely forgotten House of Lords. If you're rude about the Lords, of course they're far too dignified ever to write themselves, but their friends all write and say Bertie would be mortified if he knew that I was writing on his behalf, but you were a little unkind. Uh, to, to mention his incoherence in debate, do you realise that he had a stroke in 1947? Uh, well, one thinks to oneself, well, why is he legislating for the nation? But no, they, they do get a bit pompous. So each generation throws up its own objects of derision. Politicians almost always fill that role, and after a slight delay while we all regroup, each new government provides a fresh round of material. Mandelson's terrific. The whole dome um, folly could not have been made up by satirists. I mean, you're merely there to... Um, comment on it. Lord Legg, I mean, wonderful. Where do they find these people? Geoffrey Robinson and Bernie Eccleston, all these. Derry Irvin, doesn't matter whether they're Labour or Conservatives. Next week, Michael Bywater looks at satire on stage. Not so much a program or a way of life. Cartoons, Lampoons and Buffoons Part 1 was presented by Simon Hoggart. The readers were Charlotte Green and Peter Donaldson. The producer was Margaret Wren.